Good morning. Welcome to our morning service, the 24th of July. We're going to begin our service by coming to God in prayer. So let, let's all pray together. Father, we thank you that the psalmist reminds us that when we look to the hills, the beautiful hills, the majestic hills, the hills that have been there since the beginning of creation, where does our help come from? And the psalmist tells us that our help doesn't come from the hills themselves, from the things that were made, but our help comes from you, the maker of heaven and earth. And so we come today and we want to worship you for you made us. We want to worship you for not only have you made us, but you continue to help us. The psalmist goes on to say that we don't need to be afraid even though sometimes we're living through difficult times or even in frightening times, we don't need to be afraid for you are with us. He explains that, that as the sun is shining during the day and it's a terrific heat and we feel under pressure, you are with us. For the sun cannot harm us, nor the moon by night. In other words, when it's dark and we feel alone, and we feel as if no one really understands what we're going through. Circumstances cannot harm us, for you are there. We thank you that not only are you with us during the good times and the difficult times, you're with us always. And he goes on to say that when we come into this world, you were with us. And the day that we leave this world, Lord, you'll be there. And you'll be there to help us. You'll be there to give us grace and strength and mercy. And so this day, as we're sitting at home, watching this television screen, you're with us, right beside us, to help us, to bless us, to minister into our hearts. And so we are excited. We can't be in this church building at the moment, but it doesn't matter so much because you are with us right in our living rooms. So remind us, Lord, that we're not spectators as we sit and watch, but we're participating as one body, as we worship, as we pray, as we read, and as we consider. Consider what you're saying to us. And today, Lord, it's exciting as we we see how you're at work and there's things for us to learn and there's things for us to avoid. And so fill us with your spirit. Speak to us and draw us closer to yourself. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the church is spread throughout Uh, the known world and the reason for that is because of their persecution that has taken place in Jerusalem and we're going to read the the aftermath of of that persecution. We're going to be reading from Acts chapter 8 and we'll read from verse 5. This is God's word. Philip went out down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in the city. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. 
When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought that you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and, and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you're full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing that you have said may happen to me. When they testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Amen. Amen. Hannah is now going to come and help us worship in our homes. strong. 
to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died. This gospel truth of old shall not kneel and shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom I am free for the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me Thank you, Hannah. You have been such a blessing to us. I think the whole month of July, uh, we're having you uh, come and bless us. And so thank you so much. And we're looking forward to next week already and how you will minister into our hearts. You have a lovely voice. But not only have you a lovely voice, you have a lovely spirit. Uh, for it's all about you giving glory to God. And you can see that uh, in your face. So thank you so much. We continue our, our study, and uh, Acts is an exciting book in so many ways, and particularly uh, because of how the Holy Spirit is working in the lives of the believers. And it really hots up. Chapter 9, uh, we have the conversion of Saul, this man who stood watching Stephen die, and he was delighted to see him die. And then he decided that he would love to persecute the Christians. And he's converted. And he changes his name from Saul to Paul. And, and he becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. And in verses 10 to 11, we, we see conversion of Gentiles in Caesarea and Antioch. And so really things are happening. We, we see that Christians are happening in Jerusalem and then Samaria. And now it's going out to the ends of the world. And then we read in chapter 13 of how there's a full-blown mission to the Gentiles and Barnabas and Paul are sent out to the known world to declare God's good news. And then chapter 15, uh, the church meet together in Jerusalem. And the reason they're meeting together is they're saying there's lots of Christians uh, happening all over the world. 
And, and we need to make sure that we understand that they're one with us. And so they make a very important decision uh, in chapter 15. And the decision they make in chapter 15 is that these people who are Gentiles, they don't need to become Jews before they become Christians. It is possible for a Gentile to be a Christian without first following all the rules of the Jews. That's significant. Because the gospel is for everybody. It doesn't matter your nationality. It doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter your language. You don't have to become Scottish to become a Christian. You don't have to become a Jew to become a Christian. You're a Christian in your own culture, with your own skin, with your own language. Because the gospel is for the world not just for the Jews, not just for the Scots, but for everyone. And today we're going to look at this wonderful passage of, of the, the gospel coming to Samaria. And, and God uses Philip uh, to do that. Philip goes down and he preaches and many are, are converted. And, and it's wonderful news. There's, there's five things that we're going to have a look at today. Five lessons that are important for us today. The first thing we notice is that it's important that as a church, as we have leadership, we've got Kirk Session, it's important that we always encourage new leaders. Evangelism of Samaria is not done by the apostles, but by a young leader, a man named Philip. Philip, again, is a newcomer to the church, but he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's a great gift for evangelism, and he is leading the way into Samaria. And sometimes what we do in the church is we wait until uh, our leadership is old, and whether that's in our organizations or whether that's in the church as a whole, and sometimes what we do is we, we try to hold on to the reins of leadership, and it's not until we can't do it anymore that we think, well, we need folk to replace us. That is not how the early church did it. The early church was constantly looking for new leaders, constantly looking at ways to encourage them and giving them responsibility. And Philip is one of those new leaders. And we in Strand, we need to always be encouraging new leaders. We need to be encouraging folk to lead the service here. We need to be encouraging folk to preach. We need to be encouraging folk to lead. And, and I'm delighted that we have new members of Kirk Session that took place last year. And, and, and maybe in a couple of years' time, we might go for it. more new, new leaders. And, but in all our organizations, it's good to encourage. Our, our BB is going well, and we have new leaders in the BB. Uh, there was a number of folk that did the course last year and they've become lieutenants of the BB. We have new leaders in the GB, and, and that's exciting. And it's good to bring in new leadership. It's good to encourage the young. It's good to encourage new folk to become leaders within the, the, the church. Let's not wait until we're all old and, and we can't do it anymore, and then we look. The process of churches, we should always be nurturing and encouraging new leaders. And let's do that. Let's make sure that when, when, when maybe folk lead here for the first time or, or maybe preach here, that we encourage folk. One of the, the great worship leaders in, in the church today, uh, one of the great songwriters in the church today is a man called Matt Redman. Uh, he, he wrote 10,000 Reasons and lots of other songs. Great songs that, that we sing here in, in Strand. And I just think he's, 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 he's a great singer great songwriter, but a wonderful worship leader. But the story is told, the story is told by his youth leader uh, whenever he was a teenager and uh, the youth leader was trying to encourage him to lead and he wasn't keen to do it. He, he really wasn't keen to do it and they almost had to trick him at times uh, to lead. And then after leading uh, the youth fellowship and the youth work for a while, uh, this youth leader tried to get him to lead and encourage him to lead in the church. And this youth pastor said that uh, when he first was leading the worship in the church, a number of the older members said, look, that guy's not that good. 
he really doesn't have great talent and, and he's not particularly charismatic in the front. And, and some folk were discouraging in what they said. And now Matt Redmond is one of the best worship leaders, I think, in the world today. We need to encourage young folk. We need to encourage new leaders as they're involved in leadership. Let's encourage them and, and, and help train them that they are the leaders, not of tomorrow, but the leaders of today. That's what was happening here in the early church. There was lots of new leaders, and they went out. That was a massive responsibility to go to Samaria. We, we know about the Samaritans. We know that they're despised, and we know that Samaritans don't like Jews. And therefore, for the person to go out there to evangelize there had to be somebody who was, was a very responsible person. And you thought it might have been something like Peter or John or some one of the major apostles would have went to do it, but no, it was Philip. They were encouraging new leaders to do big things. And with God behind him, Philip did big things. And so he went and he preached and he saw great things happen and many people came to know Jesus. In fact, Lots of folk came to know Jesus. And the people came and they believed and they were baptized. Wonderful days. The second thing that we can learn that is really important that we maintain church unity. And so whenever the church in Jerusalem heard that Samaritans were becoming Christians, they sent John and Peter, the two high hitters in the church, to go and see what was happening. Now, the reason they did that was because I am sure there would have been people in the church thinking, Samaritans becoming Christians? No. They wouldn't even walk through their land. If they were going up to Galilee, they would have went the long way around rather than going through Samaria because they wouldn't want to touch anything that the Samaritans touched. They wouldn't want to come in contact with Samaritans. And so I'm sure there would have been people in the church in Jerusalem thinking, Samaritan Christians? Not sure about that. And so to keep the church unity, John and Peter go to see what, what, what happened. And when they went there, they were blessed by what they saw. And they would have come back to the church in Jerusalem and told them, this is wonderful. Great things are happening. And it's important that when we hear things happening in, in, in Strand or, or in Belfast, we should encourage it rather than thinking, can you really get a church there? Can that sort of person become a Christian? I doubt it if he could be a Christian. She a Christian? I don't think so. We should never have that attitude. When God is at work, we should encourage that and encourage the unity of the church. When we hear great things happening in the Church of Ireland or the Congregational or the Free Methodist or the Methodist, if things are happening here around us, let's be encouraged and let's recognize we are one in the Lord together. That's what the early church did. They sent out Peter and John to see what was happening and then they came back and reported the third thing that we can learn is it's important that we know that we've received the Holy Spirit. Now, this passage is quite a difficult passage for some people, uh, and it's divided the church because, you see, some people say that, that you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit after you've been converted. And therefore, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a second experience. So you become a Christian, and at some other point in your life, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. I remember going to a church. I used to go to this Bible study in this church. Uh, for It was on a Saturday night, and it must have went for about three or four years uh, when I was between 17 and 20. Loved going. And, uh, but it was a church that, that really worked and, 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 and uh, used and, and expressed the gifts of the Spirit. And, and therefore, they, they pushed this idea of second blessing. Uh, and so they believed that you became a Christian 
uh, and you received something of the Holy Spirit. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which was a big thing, you got afterwards. And once you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, you spoke in tongues, and you were able to be involved in, in various miracles, and, and, and that was so important. I remember someone explained it to me. Danny, it's like this. At the minute as a Christian, it's, it's, it's like for you, he said, it's, it's like walking in midnight. And you're walking in midnight, and there's a lovely moon, and you can see things. But there's only so much you can see because it's dark. The, the moon is shining up and you can see lots of nice things, but you can't see them properly. But once you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, he said to me, then it's like walking down that same street, but at midday when the sun is shining. And so you can see the same things that you saw at midnight, but they're full of color because there's so much more light and you can see the reds and the oranges and the yellows, whereas midnight is just different shades of navy. And therefore, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, they said. I was never convinced of that, I have to be honest. And, and they used this passage to, to show that, that the Samaritans, they became Christians, they were baptized. And then later on, when John and, and Peter came, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it was so different for them. And other Christians uh, explain, no, it's, it's one event. When you become a Christian, then you receive the Holy Spirit. And what was happening uh, with, with these folk in, in Samaria was they accepted Jesus and, and they wanted to follow him, but they hadn't actually accepted the Holy Spirit at that stage. Uh, and they, they, it was a, a two-way thing. And because the Samaritans uh, were, were particularly despised people, it was almost as if God was waiting until John and Peter came and so that Peter and John could witness the coming of the Holy Spirit in their life. And therefore, this, the Samaritans was a special case. And that's why God gave them a particular blessing of the Holy Spirit. Whatever you believe in, and I don't want to go into it this morning because there's, there's other things for us to look at, but what is very, very obvious is that whenever you become a Christian and the Holy Spirit comes into your life, you know it. Being a Christian, you know that you're Christian. I remember before I became a Christian, I was so afraid of death. And, and when I became a Christian, it was amazing. I was really afraid of death. Uh, that fear totally left me. And, and I have lots of doubts about lots of things. But I certainly have no doubts about heaven. And, and I'm looking forward to it in that sense. I am not a bit afraid of dying because of what Jesus has done for us. And I believe part of that is because at the time when I became a Christian, God filled me with his spirit. The next thing, and, and we'll go very quickly here, the next two things, is the next thing is we need to be realizing that there's people who will be miracle workers, but they're not necessarily of God. There's Simon the sorcerer. He loved the power that spiritual life gave him. And, and he was able to do magic, and he was able to do lots of things. And, and he loved the power and the prestige. And so when he, when he sees that Peter and John lay hands on the believers, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit, he wants that because he sees it as power. And we need to recognize there's people in the church, there's people in society, and, and I think we're living in a society that is really interested in spiritualist stuff. They're really interested in the spiritual realm. And so there's lots of people talk about angels, and of course there's, the angels exist, and of course there's angels. But people, people want more interested in angels than they are of Jesus. And, and people are, are, are interested in, in mediums, and they're interested in communicating with the dead, and they're interested in all those things. And, and we need to recognize that people want the prestige of, of the power of being spiritual but they don't really want the relationship with God. And we need to oppose that. We need to recognize that that is wrong. The Christian life is more than just having the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's that relationship we have with God. And finally, we need to recognize that there is a danger in, in wanting money. There is a trap in, in, in money and power. And for Simon, that's all he was after. He, he wanted the gifts and he wanted to use the gifts for his own power. And I think as Christians, we, we are always need to be careful of the trap of money and power. 
that we do things for the power and the prestige or we do things for the money and, and, and for the, the rewards that we can get. And so we do the right things for the wrong reasons. We need to always watch that. But this morning, let's rejoice for the, 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 the promise that Jesus makes that the gospel, the good news, will go from Jerusalem to Samaria happened in Acts chapter 8. And it continues to happen as it goes to the ends of the earth. And we are witnesses to that. Let's make sure that we know who we are. Let's recognize that we nurture our new leaders. That we're filled with the Spirit. That we keep the oneness of the Holy Spirit. That we oppose those who want the power of spiritual life. And not the relationship of the, of the spiritual life. And let's always be aware of the trap of prestige, power, and money. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're at work in the church. And you're at work in the church today, and you are filling your people with your spirit. You're giving us gifts to use to glorify your name. Help us to nurture and encourage the gifts that we see in the people in Strand. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.